Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Our program tonight is uh, Saving the City. Uh, Ron Blattman is here to speak about his project. It's a, it's a video project. Um, he has been putting together, he's known for Saving the Bay, uh, which was on all the public uh, television stations a few years ago, um, and uh, won awards, etc. And so he's got a new project, Saving the City, and he got it started years ago. I met him at a party, and we set this uh, program up for April of 2020. And of course, the pandemic got in the way, so now here we are. Um, in the meantime, he's got a lot more filmed, etc. But he's putting this huge project together, and it's about almost all the important issues that we are now facing in San Francisco, and have and, and plenty of other cities as well. And this is not just about San Francisco; it's about all the cities. So we're going to go deeply into what really makes cities click and why we have to keep them as healthy as possible, because it's really an important part of any economy uh, and obviously the economy in san francisco is doing very well but we have other problems so ron thank you very much for uh, first being patient for three years <laughs> and then sharing this with us thanks for joining us thanks george for the invitation and for being so patient that I'm so, <laughs> i can still come back <laughs> so um just a couple of quick things uh, just wanted you know i don't know how many of you live in how many of you guys live in the city to see wow so almost everybody who lives in the city, I hope you vote. That's a subject for, <laughs> that's, that's a subject for later when people are gonna say, what can we do <laughs> about making our city better? But um, I'm a city native, I grew up here, uh, public schools, Berkeley, um, then I went to grad school back east. And uh, most of my life has been as a real estate guy. I was recruited back home from Wall Street to be the head of business development in the mayor's office way back when Frank Jordan was mayor. Um, went back into the real estate world, but I'm a city junkie. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have been flown all over the country for jobs to look at cities and markets, and I do it for fun. And I've dragged our twin boys that are 26 to cities all over the country. Um, we do a lot of hiking in my house. Um, my kids have hiked all of downtown St. Louis, all of downtown Houston, <laughs> all of downtown Portland, et cetera, et cetera. And they both work downtown for real estate firms. What a surprise. Uh, and they live in the city. But um, I, I'm very concerned. I'm a city guy, and I've watched... In San Francisco, even before COVID, um, we're a city that is, without getting into too much detail right now, tremendously mismanaged, unbelievably inefficient. Um, tremendous, we have tremendous resources like no other city can probably imagine, and that's what makes it all the more frustrating and damning, is that we're lucky with what we have, as opposed to so many cities that I know about that frankly don't have anywhere near what we do and want even just a sliver of what we have. And going around the country for many different reasons, I would see cities that would do really interesting things in the name of trying to make themselves better. And I would see San Francisco and other cities spend lots of money on things in the name of making themselves better, but they really weren't that bright. And, and so I thought, um, how do you combat that? How do you sort of deal with that? And um, I'm sort of an information junkie, and I have found throughout my career that usually when people are presented with good information, regardless of where they start out on an issue, they tend to respond pretty well to good information because most people want to do the right thing. But can you get good information? So that means doing something in the information business, doing something in media, and the currency in media is video that's the most watched. So I hatched an idea to do a, basically it's a, it's a video series that is most likely going to be a public TV um, broadcast. My Saving the Bay series was a national PBS primetime series on the history of San Francisco Bay that Robert Redford narrated. And so um, now I'm doing this one about remaking cities. It's not just about San Francisco, but it's about cities all over the U.S. and Canada. And it's organized, as you will see in this little video clip that's a teaser, it's organized by subject, not by city, so we can compare how different cities approach the same subject. And um, just really quickly, we are expecting our first 60-minute program to be done hopefully this fall. And we also have begun work on the next three programs after that. Um, I have 20 episodes outlined on the web. I have endless stories. I have endless access to the people behind those stories. Um, but 
you have to get them done. You have to raise the money. This is all nonprofit educational films. So, you know, it's a process. But um, let me start by sh giving you guys like a short introduction a video that will give you an idea about what we're, what we're up to. America has always had a love-hate relationship with cities. Yet over 80% of us live in urban centers, a number expected to reach 90% by the year 2050. People are moving to cities to have a better chance for themselves, for their kids, for education, for health, to connect, to be together. In a city, there's a sense of a public realm, of, of public places, of a sense that we all own this together, we're all in this together. Saving the city is one of the most ambitious examinations of the urban experience ever undertaken featuring a multi-part national television series, along with a comprehensive educational curriculum, the objective of Saving the City is nothing less than the creation of an ongoing national dialogue about why cities are important, why we should care about their vitality, and how to make our cities into more desirable places. Cities are really the greatest challenge that we have as a species and also the celebration of our greatest success. Telling stories through the eyes of people who use the city, we meet those who help shape our cities, from planners and politicians to ordinary citizens and keen observers of the urban scene. Their stories, gathered in more than 30 cities across the United States and Canada, are organized around subjects, not cities. Themes such as housing, Living in a community mixed in age, as well as race and gender and orientation and place of origin, all of those things really, really matter to giving a richness to our lives. Arts and culture. Cities historically have been places where people created culture, as well as consumed culture. And they still are. Food, markets, and dining. Food has been crucial to environment and making environment whole since man first dragged a, you know, a beast back into the cave and put a picture of it up on the wall. <laughs> Transportation. Great cities can only thrive, especially as they attain greater densities, if there's transportation choices that are available to everyone to move around. And parks and public spaces. To be successful, a city really has to understand how to integrate nature and the built city. From the team that created Saving the Bay, the award-winning national PBS TV series, comes an unprecedented look at the urban experience. Informative, entertaining, urgent. Saving the city is media that matters. Cities are finally shaped by consumer demand, by what average people want, not architects and landscape architects and public officials, but citizens, then it becomes urgent to you to make sure that they are demanding very good things. Cities are made for people to be together, and that's what fosters innovation, and that's why we have to make cities great, and we have to make cities survive and thrive. After watching Saving the City, you'll never look at cities the same way again. To learn more, including how to support this groundbreaking project, please visit savingthecity.org. So that's, that's just an intro piece. It's a teaser. This was done before COVID. And, um, but things haven't changed. In fact, the problems have just become more acute and the subject has become sort of, a, has been more on, in the front lobes of people's brains in terms of what do we do about the future of cities. And, and also the original intent about this was how to make cities better. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of cities that if cities work, that's an if, but if they work, they're the best places to be, they're the best places to work, the best places to play, the best places to raise kids, but how do you make them work? How do you make it, how do you get that cocktail of quality of life things going that cities, that people come to cities by choice? 
And um, so the idea behind this series is to take a look at what people are doing, especially people stories, because you can, it's not so much fight City Hall, but we've uncovered lots and lots of stories where there are just, they're individuals, they're small groups of people that have made huge differences in their communities. And, um, you know, so beyond all the stuff that gets in the news all the time, there are a lot of really good things going on in cities as well. So we're going to cover that. The first subject, I'm going to show some slides. The first thing I want to talk about is something that's on the sort of front lines in San Francisco a lot is what do we do about all our empty office buildings? And a couple of things. Number one, San Francisco is an anomaly um, in the sense that this issue about empty office buildings has been plaguing most cities for over 20 years. It's just San Francisco, we were, we were an outlier. We had this unbelievable economic growth spurt. We had this unbelievable number of tech companies in particular that were growing and expanding and grabbing space here. Whereas most other cities have been dealing with this kind of issue for a long time. I watched a video from 2006 the other night from Cleveland and it's 2006. And part of that video about Cleveland in a declining city was they went floor by floor in a modern office tower saying, yep, this one's clear, this one's clear, this one's clear. What do we do about all our millions of square feet of empty office space? So these are issues that are not new. Um, in New York, for example, there's a lot of talk about, oh, convert to residential. So after 2001, after September 11th, it had already been on its way, but then it got turbocharged after that to take lower Manhattan and convert a lot of the outdated office buildings to residential and now if you go you know to wall street there's a whole foods there's a tiffany store it's like it became a community it's where people live because most of the business stuff was already moving to midtown in new york even pre-2001 but new york successfully was able to turn lower manhattan and wall street into a live play work 24-hour city in la of all places where they built an entirely new downtown Starting in the 1970s and 80s up on Bunker Hill, they built a corporate acropolis that has never worked, but they literally abandoned their old downtown, which is on Broadway, which is on Broadway and Spring and to the east of there. Those buildings were almost uniformly empty except for the ground floors. And in 1980, 1998, 1999, there was a development team, the Central LA Association and the city got together and they changed fire codes and building codes in what was called or what is called the adaptive reuse ordinance for how to make it easier to convert those buildings into residential. So today there are close to 80,000 people. I mean, some of it's in new towers, but there are 80,000 people living in downtown LA where there weren't people working before. There may not have been an office building built in LA for the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, LA has an awful office market downtown. Think about what it is now when it was awful before the pandemic and it was awful 10 years ago and it was awful 20 years ago. And they have managed to, you know, it's not just building conversions, but it's, you know, getting people to live downtown. And then I'm going to show a few pictures here on that subject, which. Um, Brad, yeah. You know, has anybody else done this where they compared all the different cities and who did it right and who's done it wrong? Because a lot of times we just kind of make it up and without paying attention to what other people have done. But did, did you did you base this on something else that you'd seen where somebody? No, in fact, it it's a good question. Yeah. I actually thought because I have this 50,000 foot viewpoint of having looked all over. I mean, I've been to all these places many times is that looking at it from up here, you see all these patterns. Mm -hmm. nationally. And what I see is that I've always seen things focused, well done or not well done, mm -hmm. but focus on a specific place. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be really interesting to examine the patterns and mm -hmm. examine how different places approach the same issue so that you get kind of a best practices yeah. out of that. So I, I sort of created that idea of doing the comparative site. That's kind of, that's part of my sales pitch when I'm out, fund, <laughs> fun, I mean, frankly, when I'm out fundraising yeah. is that I'm trying to do something different, right. you know, because it's, it's not like nobody's ever covered these subjects before. Right. Both, both well and not well. It's just, I haven't really seen stuff where it's so heavily comparative, right. if you will. So this is a building, this was no relation to First Republic. This was Republic National Bank of Texas. This building had been vacant for, I think, 10 years, if not longer, completely vacant. And it was bought and it was redone. It's now 333 apartments. It's a four-star hotel. It's a little bit of office and it's retail on the ground floor. It opened last year after being vacant for over, you know, again, forget COVID. They had an issue in Dallas of empty buildings, you know, forever. This is nothing new. Um, part of what we're trying to do with what we're doing with the series is a lot of these issues are not new, nor are solutions for how to solve these issues. I mean, things go in cycles, but, you know, I can show you guys, if you go to YouTube, there's a cartoon from 1955. It's pretty funny. 
But the number one problem facing the United States was affordable housing in 1955, according to this cartoon. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's almost 70 years ago, but affordable housing was a big deal then too. It doesn't mean that we have all the answers, but we've been, you know, people shouldn't just discount that a lot of things have been tried mm -hmm. to, to do things. So anyway, this is one example in Dallas. This is a 1980s 50-story office building, Thanksgiving Tower. Well, it's now called Santander Tower for the Spanish bank that has a big operation inside this. 12 floors are being converted to apartments. The top two floors, and I don't get the economics of this, but the top two floors are a luxury hotel. And <laughs> um, I say it just because that's a small number of rooms to amortize your cost over right. what you're doing. But the, and the same team that is doing this building has this building, which is a 60-story Philip Johnson designed Granite Bank Headquarters for Comerica Bank, which is a big national bank that moved to Dallas from Detroit 20 years ago. And you know, this has marble, this is like a 101 California kind of building. It's got marble lobbies and marble in the elevators and what have you. There, and Comerica Bank is headquartered here. And they're actually converting a dozen floors of this to apartments, even while the bank's headquarters are there. And this is, you know, one of those things in which we talk about this is a big floor plate building. This is from the late 80s or mid to late 80s. And somehow they're economically figuring out they think they can do it. Um, and it's in Dallas, which has a growing residential population downtown because amazingly, these kinds of buildings have been out of favor for the last 10, 12 years in Dallas. And the law firms and consulting firms and accounting firms that would have occupied it have actually moved, reasons I don't totally get, to these 15 to 20 story squat glass boxes to what's called Uptown, which is on the, just north of the Stemmons Freeway, or not Stemmons, but just north of the freeway in Dallas from downtown to the Uptown area. So they've given up like the 42nd floor view for a newer 20 story boxy building. So there's a tremendous amount of space that is being reimagined in a, in a place like Dallas. This was even, I mean, this is after COVID, but Dallas was working on this stuff before COVID. Um, Are those boxy buildings in Dallas uh, near like the highway, so it's easier to commute to them? Or not necessarily. Like that? It's not, not, yeah, not, not the necessarily. There's a, there's a downtown Dallas, which is a traditional urban core, and then there's an uptown Dallas, which is just north of the freeway, which is, there's a great freeway park that's a, that's a deck, two and a half blocks that was decked over the park called mm -hmm. um, Clyde Warren Park that's now being extended. And it has actually helped bridge the divide between the two. But Uptown is kind of where the brand name restaurants went. It's where the McKinsey's went. It's where a lot of the big law firms went. Um, but it's not a great place to walk around. Yeah. But they, it's just, it was newer. Um, Dallas's big issue, which is similar to Atlanta's, which is similar to another, a number of other cities, their big issue, frankly, is if you go from downtown to uptown and you're a company, that's a win for Dallas because Dallas's competition is not that. That's the urban core of Dallas. Dallas's competition is really most of the companies go north to Plano, to Frisco, to McKinney. When you hear about all these companies moving to Dallas, they don't really move to Dallas for the most part. They go to the nor far northern suburbs, mm -hmm. which are, you know, and so that's a much bigger, if you will, threat to the city mm -hmm. than they hopped 10 or 12 blocks to the north mm -hmm. kind of thing. That's a similar thing in Atlanta. It's a similar thing in some other places. Um, and then in Philadelphia, this is all pre-COVID stuff. This is uh, a building, believe it or not, from 1932. It's a famous architectural building, the PSFS Tower in Philadelphia. This was a savings bank office building, but it's a four-star Lowe's hotel now, the entire building. And um, they, they've done an incredible job of converting buildings to hotels in Philadelphia. So they have old office buildings. This is Gerard Bank, um, both the banking hall and the tower. This is now a Ritz-Carlton that's the, that's the lobby of the Ritz-Carlton, which is an old banking hall. Um, this is the old May Company department store in Cleveland that just opened as apartments on Public Square. In this case, because it's a department store with huge floors, they, they created an atrium in the middle to give light and air for the space. Um, this is in Cleveland also. I'm going to film a story about this. This is at 9th and Euclid, which was, used to be their main banking corner in Cleveland. This was the old Cleveland Trust Bank building. And um, you take a look at what it is now. It's a supermarket. Um, and this is, this is a supermarket chain. It's run by two brothers. It's called Heinen's. It's a family business. It's old line in Cleveland. I want to do a story on these guys as well. They never had a store in the city of Cleveland. They were always in the suburbs. They're a high-end market. They're kind of, kind of like a Molly Stone would be the closest thing to compare them to. And they decided to go into downtown about six, seven years ago. And they, they have this building and a building next to it. So it's a full-blown supermarket. 
down below is prepared food up above is where they have wine wine and booze and they have all kinds of events at night that they do there but this is you know this is cleveland and you scratch your head and you say whoa you know i'm not telling you to move there but there's some interesting there's there's interesting things going on in these cities that's the that's the supermarket dome you know which is <laughs> which is pretty astonishing um, this just opened a couple of years ago in Indianapolis. Um, I took these last summer when I was there. It's an old Coca-Cola bottling plant on the edge of downtown. It's now a hotel. Um, that's the lobby in the hotel. You know, you wouldn't think Indianapolis had stuff necessarily like this. Um, and everybody has to have a food hall today. So um, if you don't have a farm to table food hall, then you're, you're nobody. But if you think about food halls, they're not really that much different than what was the big rage back in the late 70s, early 80s, which were the festival marketplaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had the first one in the world, which was Ghirardelli Square, but the one that's most famous is probably Faneuil Hall in Boston. Mm -hmm. And then there was Harbor Place that came in Baltimore and a bunch of other ones. Harbor Place, by the way, is in bankruptcy. It is complete, almost, almost completely vacant right now. Mm -hmm. um, it is, there was a new buyer, again, within the last couple of months out of receivership to try and do something. But, you know, things ebb and flow. This, I, this thing that there are vacancies, that there are issues and all the rest, it's nothing new. And, and cities have dealt with it before. The issue is who's going to step up and provide the leadership? It's not just capital, but who's going to provide the leadership to, to get these things done? Um, and then we've done it in San Francisco. This is from 2002. This was for those of us old enough to remember United California Bank and then First Interstate Bank. This was 405. This is 405 Montgomery Street, and it's the Omni Hotel, which they did a great job of, right in the middle of the financial district. You know, um, people forget that we did that. This was originally built for Metropolitan Life for their Western headquarters. This is the Ritz Carlton up on Knob Hill. You know, this was an office building, um, and this was the Chronicle building. And it was gutted. It's the Ritz Carlton residences, you know, at Third and Market that we've got. And then right now, this was just extended with its permit, but this is supposed to become a five-star Auberge hotel. It's the old Hearst building. And it's kind of it's kind of an irony in all these cities. The newspapers are all kind of gone and all of their old buildings are I mean the Chicago Tribune building is this incredible condominium tower. Mm -hmm. Now I went I got a tour of it last summer and it's like it's beautiful what they did, but that was the whole building was the Chicago Tribune mm -hmm. at one time, you know in Chicago. So, um, you know, it's not like we've never done it and it's not like people haven't dealt with it before, but it's, can you take a number of things out of the equation? Can you create certainty? Can you, can you create a timetable that people will still be alive to see what they're working on? You know, mm -hmm. those, those kinds of things. Um, and then you have, in a sense, when people talk about what do we do with empty office space and people will never come back to work, there's one city in America in which their downtown is no longer a central business district and hasn't been for at least 25 years. And that's San Diego. For any of you guys that are familiar with San Diego, if you go to downtown San Diego, there are people all over the streets. The convention center does a ton of business. It's huge competition for Moscone. In fact, it might be their number one direct competitor. Um, they have hotels up the gazoo and they have 40,000 people that live downtown and they have supermarkets and restaurants and all kinds of things. There's only one thing downtown San Diego doesn't have. They don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. It is most of the jobs. I mean, there's a row in the back at the top. I guess there's a pointer here. Here is sort of the old office district, but everything else here, it's all residential and over here by the water, it's all hotels and residential. So it's a very small office component in San Diego. Um, we did a film for a big major international accounting firm. And so I looked up in San Diego, not one accounting firm is downtown. Almost all the major law firms are north. Almost everybody in the business world is north of the city. So they've rebuilt an entire downtown without offices hmm. and, and it's busy. So, you know, these things kind of, you know, they exist. And so, you know, that's kind of to talk about the offices. We shot a story a while ago here. It's a, I'm jumping subjects here to something that's near and dear to my heart because I'm a public school kid and my brother taught in the public schools here in the city and we raised our boys in the city, but they didn't go to public school. Um, is that um, Mission Bay in San Francisco is in a city that we always wring our hands about why we have the lowest percentage of kids in the country of any major city. And the excuse is usually given or always given that it's because it's so expensive to live here. And I say baloney. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are plenty of people, and I know this from other cities, there are plenty of people that will be, pay a premium to be in San Francisco, give up a backyard, give up one of two cars if they have to. But the question is, where do the kids go to school? And you know, I'm, I'm, it's a whole other diatribe to get into the San Francisco school district 
any, you know, they call themselves the unified school district, but they're anything but unified. And, um, <laughs> and it's the cost of private school. I mean, I was just talking to people the other day. I mean, it's 50,000 bucks a year to send your kid to a K through eight school. <laughs> If you pay full freight, you have two kids or three kids, you know, after tax dollars, you're not moving out of the city because necessarily, you're not moving to a city with a good school district because it's so cheap to move to. You're moving because the cost of schooling is so expensive. So we have a huge new development, Mission Bay, 10,000 people, family housing built there. School district is given land for free as part of the deal for UCSF to be there. There was a parcel for a school. There's no school. And um, we shot this a number of years ago. It's a comparison to Vancouver. You'll see it in a second. And it's about how come, Van how come we don't have a school and how come Vancouver built schools and has thousands of kids walk to school every day in downtown Vancouver. And then I'll give you the punchline after you watch this little short video. This is a tale of two cities, two of North America's favorite cities. Vancouver and San Francisco. Both announced plans to create vital new neighborhoods on former rail yards at the water's edge, along False Creek in Vancouver and in Mission Bay in San Francisco. Yet only one has succeeded in attracting and keeping families with children. As far as the city of Vancouver going right back to the 1970s, we had a reform council and they decided that we wanted families with children in the city. So it was very much a public policy objective. From the beginning, we said there needed to be a clustering of community facilities at the heart of that new neighborhood that we were designing. So that meant a community center, child care, and the school. I can remember when we had the public meetings about the design of the Elsie Roy School, and uh, all these families with children showed up. I was just amazed. It became very apparent that the school was going to be full the moment it opened. It is never too early to start planning for the school. It's the absolute bedrock of building healthy society. But that's not what happened in San Francisco's Mission Bay. Despite land being given to the school district, no school has been built and a separate playground and a little league park remain fields of dreams. Okay, bye. Your mommy kiss goodbye. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. Okay, that leaves Mission Bay families like the Wallaces with very few neighborhood options for their children and a grinding commute to get their kids to school. Mission Bay was just being built out and there was a lot of talk around the mayor wanting to create a neighborhood in the city that was very kid and family friendly. One of the things they said in this neighborhood, there would be a school just within blocks. The school has not come to fruition. This is where many cities fail. They forget that it's about the school, that it's about the things that happen in the community center that would be supportive of that child. Mission Bay, although still a work in progress, has already attracted hundreds of families with very young children. But the only public resource that serves neighborhood families is the local library, where story times have seen as many as 140 people crammed into a room meant to hold 55. The fire department had to be called in to limit attendance. I saw a green dock. We have to turn people away. If we had story times all day long, seven days a week, I don't think that we would still meet the demand. Parents in Vancouver, like Melanie Osmak, have had a very different experience. They wouldn't live anywhere else. We can walk everywhere. We don't waste three hours of our day sitting in traffic. We've got a lot of parks. I mean, if you look out my window, you can see three of them just from my window. There's five parks we can get to in less than 10 minutes. Vancouver now has thousands of school-aged children living in and around its downtown. In Mission Bay and surrounding downtown San Francisco neighborhoods, it's a much different story. Most of the kids that Sara has grown up with in this neighborhood have all left. Personally, I'd, I'd like my daughter to grow up in the city. I feel like there's so much the city has to offer her in terms of culture and the diversity. 
But without a neighborhood school, without a community center, without the resources that make neighborhoods family friendly, the Wallaces felt they had no choice. Reluctantly, they left Mission Bay for the suburbs. If the education problem was solved, we'd still be here. We wouldn't be leaving. And we should be planning and designing our cities so that children are not only tolerated, they are welcomed, they are encouraged, and it's a rich, exciting place for a kid to grow up. To learn more, including how to support this groundbreaking project, please visit savingthecity.org. Good news is after, I don't know, 14 or 16 or 8, I mean, literally it's over 10 years that that land had sat empty at Mission Bay. There was a groundbreaking two months ago for the Mission Bay School, finally. It doesn't open until the fall of 2025. Hmm. Um, you can bet that there have been literally hundreds, if not on the low thousands of families, that they all turn five and you know it's just automatic, you're gone. And you sort of think to yourself, but Marketing 101 would say you're building a brand new neighborhood for thousands of people. If you're a city and you want to attract families, you would build the school right away, even early, and use it as the magnet to get people, which I'll show you places that have done that. But in San Francisco, what you, I, I didn't interview school district people, but I know what their response has been having talked to them, which is, you know, we don't have the money to build it. We don't have the money to operate it. There's not enough kids to do it. You know, they're like a circular firing squad. They, they don't know, you know, it's like they, they don't know what they're missing because they don't even know about the people who they never even come in contact with, who just automatically leave. And um, one of the things that was an outgrowth of, for example, no schools that were in that entire area is there's an Italian day school here, La Scuola, which is now, I think, in its eighth year. So the kids have reached eighth grade. And that was, and there's another school called Presidio Knowles, which is a Mandarin immersion school that started in the Presidio. It now is on 10th Street by Folsom in an old church school. La Scuola was on two campuses. They just bought last year an old church school in the Mission to do full-blown, you know, there's a full-blown 300 kids or more in their private schools. It's because of a woman from Bologna who I interviewed for the story, but we didn't put her in the video, and another, an Asian woman who both lived just outside of Mission Bay. There were no schools, so they took it upon themselves to start schools <laughs> in, in the city. And I mean, that's, you know, and then we wonder, well, how can we have so few kids? You know, I mean, because it's more important to take Lincoln off the name of schools. Or, you know, or who knew that Dianne Feinstein had slaves? I mean, whatever the, 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 you know, whatever the garbage that people can conjure up in this town. And they think, you know, it's, it's funny, but the whole world knows about it because of social media and because of regular media. We're like the laughing stock of the world with a lot of the stuff that we do. And then we say, oh, Moscone's not filled anymore. Well, gee, I mean, it's not, it's not hard to figure out. And here's a shot that I took the other day in Mission Bay because I happened to notice this just driving through. Um, this is right on 4th Street, it's a new private school. It's a Montessori school. It's part of a chain of schools around the country. They're independent nonprofits. They're gonna open up a private school in Mission Bay that will, it's small. It's only gonna max out at probably 45 kids, but it's a, you know, it's gonna be, I think, a K through six or K through eight school. So it's very small, but it's in a storefront in Mission Bay where, um, you know, the playground finally did open, but the ball fields have never opened. Um, and it's, you know, to me, it's a tragedy in terms of just like a missed opportunity for how do you attract kids and how do you basically, you know, have a city that's well-rounded, if you will. And we just, we don't do that. Meanwhile, um, this is Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma is a city that has, not, has nobody that lives downtown or had nobody that lives downtown and still has very few people. And they had the opposite view of Mission Bay. They've done a whole series of things downtown to say we want to bring families and people to live down here. So one of the things that they did is they built a school. Um, those are actually two towers in the distance. The one to the right is um, the 54-story Devon Tower here dominates the skyline. You'll see it in another picture with a park. This is less than three blocks from the tallest building in town. They devoted a square block to a new public school before people lived there. Um, the mayor who put it on the ballot wanted it to be a charter school, so it's a public charter. Nobody lives there. It's an oversubscribed school. And the kids are now up into the seventh and eighth grades, so they have them off-site in a middle school, and they're debating, do they build a high school downtown? Because they want to send a signal to people that institutionally, we're here. We want you to be here. We're going to provide the amenities. I'll show you parks a little bit later. We want to provide that sort of cocktail of amenities that will get you to come here, which is the opposite of what we do here. Um, so... 
you know, this is the John Rex School that's in Oklahoma City. This is what they do in New York. They've done this in half a dozen places in New York. Um, this is a 42-story building behind the, uh, this part of the building here. This is a historic building that was empty for years. This is in Lower Manhattan. All of this is a new elementary school that's built into the base of the high rise. And New York has done this in several places where they have had the developers build schools into the towers. And you scratch your head and you go, come on, we're the city that exacts more out of anybody than anyone. And nobody ever had, you know, I shouldn't say nobody did because St. Mary's School is in Chinatown on Kearney, is, the, is a Catholic school that's built into um, nonprofit housing that's there. And there's an approval, but we'll see if the economics make it work. The French American School was just approved for a 38 story tower on Franklin and Oak, um, with the first five floors being the school and then a residential tower above. But from the public side, there's certainly nothing that's, that's being done that way. Um, this is in Newark, New Jersey. It's a story we want to film. There's a central part of downtown Newark, which is not a hot spot by any means. And there's a development there called Teacher's Village. It's uh, a number of apartment buildings, 200, 207 units strictly for teachers, for apartments for teachers. And it, the whole project is anchored by three charter schools. And it's done, I'm interested in it, succeed or not succeed just for who had the guts to anchor a project with three schools. But it's apparently been, I've met with the people who did it, it's apparently been very successful to date for what they did. And it's sort of like, where's our imagination here to be able to, even if it doesn't work, where, where are we pushing the envelope to, to do things, you know? So they arrange for the teachers to, to live right next to the schools? That they, they teach it, it, well, it could be, or it could be open to any teacher. Yeah, I understand. But the yeah. basic idea is to make housing right next to the schools where they work? Either right next to the schools or, mm -hmm. yeah, or just teachers in general, I think. Yeah, yeah it's a, the idea is to provide it. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk here about doing that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's some things being done for students now that, I mean, but there's things you know, that have been in works for since I was in City Hall in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. They talked about, for example, dorm projects that would be shared by multiple schools. Mm -hmm. the, the new Hastings complex um, that's being done um, in the Tenderloin is going to is going to be open for other schools to share mm -hmm. facilities. Mm -hmm. And um, I think teacher housing was supposed to go at the in the park side on an old school site um, that was that was developed here. But um, it's just you know it's the idea right. about what these guys were doing, um, and then. We'll go to another subject. I'm just jumping subjects here. This is one that's on everybody's mind all over the country. It's just kind of amazing how you hear about it elsewhere. When I was just on different trips back east, I was in New York and in Boston, and I was down in Florida and Atlanta and Birmingham, and people complain about homelessness, and you look around and you go, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> um, you know, even in Washington, D.C., they see two tents, and they think the city's being taken over. And, um, you know, it's like come out to not just San Francisco. It's frankly, it's, it's a West Coast issue from Vancouver down to San Diego. And, um, and Denver's no great shakes either. So we did a story that we shot before COVID and then we updated after COVID that's um, part of a three-legged stool. We will compare LA to Houston and to an un undecided yet probably East Coast city um, for homelessness. But we did a piece on Skid Row in LA where it's, if you guys ever been down there, it's truly dystopic as to what goes on in LA. So here's a video on homelessness in LA. The homeless, the unhoused, less charitably, bums, hobos, derelicts. It's a reality of any city, but why has homelessness become such a crisis that now it turns neighbors into enemies and has become a driving story in national media? Who are these people, these hundreds of thousands of people, and how did they get there, and why, and what are we doing about it? What is this, anyway? Ah. It's an eyesore, not to mention a health hazard. Apartments look out on the filth, and so does the First Southern Baptist Church. You can smell it in the air sometimes. I live here. Me and my neighbors get to stay and sleep safely another night. The core complement of, of people who are experiencing homelessness have a common thread in being poor. They're often um, under or uneducated. They come from populations that we've sort of disenfranchised and stripped of opportunity. The very nature of homelessness in LA has really radically transformed. Even though there have for many years been tens of thousands of people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles, over the last five years is the first time that homelessness has appeared in wealthier neighborhoods, in neighborhoods where it hasn't before. And that's the reason why it's become such a politically salient issue now. It's a human rights catastrophe, and it's got to stop, and we have to stop normalizing it. 
This is Saving the City, where we talk about how cities figure it out. Today, we're looking at Los Angeles, which despite its enormous prosperity, is facing perhaps the biggest homelessness crisis in the nation. It's become its poster child. Mike Arnold has been at the front lines of helping the homeless in Los Angeles for decades. So we have a whole series of public systems that are failing people. A high number of kids who leave the foster care system end up being homeless. A high percentage of people who leave our correctional systems end up being homeless. We have a mental health care system that fails people to leave them on the streets. I mean, our military system takes people, damages them, and then discharges them to the street. And the failures of all of those public systems, I think, are really what is driving homelessness in our respective communities. Hal Bastian is a real estate consultant and booster for downtown LA. People vote where they live, right? And very few people used to live in downtown Los Angeles. So we, we as a matter of public policy, put all of our missions and social services in an area of downtown where there are almost no voters, so you wouldn't get voted out of office. Because almost everybody cares about people living in the streets and mental illness, as long as the solutions are not located within their own neighborhoods. Let's step back to the birth of California. The Golden State has always been the object of great dreams and great disappointments. City leaders came up with a solution, concentrate public services downtown. Tom Gilmore is a downtown property developer. At that time, in the 70s, downtown was a pretty dysfunctional place already. It was the place nobody lived, so let's put them all downtown. So they literally created a designated area called Skid Row, which, God bless them, I'm always amazed at the marketing geniuses at City Hall. And next thing you know, we have the greatest concentration of homeless in America in Skid Row. A really powerful solution to homelessness is to be able to reconnect people to things that they've been connected with. When people leave their communities, they leave connections, and connections are incredibly stabilizing. And I think a great solution would be to have small, personalized, homeless solutions in every community in Los Angeles. Cities across the U.S. are facing the same crisis, made even more acute with the availability of cheap synthetic drugs that have intensified mental health issues. The longer a person experiences homelessness, the harder it is to get them back into stable housing because they get, they get damaged. They get PTSD, um, they may start medicating, and again, there's a predator on every street corner, and, and there's a saying in Skid Row, the first one's free. And if you're not ready to buy it, buy the second one, the second one's free, but there will be a time when you will do anything to buy what I have to offer. So what's to be done? Here are three strategies that have made a dent in the problem. First, a physical housing unit. Second, case management and other support services. And third, rental assistance. Salt Lake City cut chronic homelessness by 70 to 90 percent from 2005 to 2015 as an early adopter of the housing first strategy that's widely followed around the country. Thank you, Mayor Wilson and Mayor Mendenhall for all that you and your respective administrations have done to make this affordable housing project possible. Housing First prioritizes permanent supportive housing as opposed to just providing temporary shelter. Of course, creating enough units is costly and takes time. And yet Houston cut the number of people sleeping on its streets by half from 2011 to 2020 by marrying a strong reliance on centralized data to the Housing First agenda dubbed the Way Home. Another model is Boston, which participates in the Massachusetts Pay for Success program that has exceeded its goals since starting in 2015 with the Social Innovation Financing Initiative. The state reimburses private seed capital to help ensure housing and service providers face no financial risk. Better to give people help before the whole situation seems helpless. There's been a lot of gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands about how complicated homelessness is. We've made it complicated. We have decided that it's daunting and unsolvable. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. We plan on getting a house, yeah. About a month or so, I'll be out. What a difference a day makes. Just eight hours after we aired an I-Team report on the filth found along our freeway, state crews came out and cleaned up the trash on the 101 off-ramp featured in our story last night. Mm -hmm. 
So we've got a longer version of that on our website, but we're going to be filming in Houston because I've spent some time talking to people in Houston about what they did to cut homelessness in half and one of the, one of the major things that they did. And I, I, I just, I'll stand up here and say, I don't know enough about what we do in San Francisco. I know we spend ungodly amounts of money for not godly results, <laughs> but I don't know enough about our process. I know in Houston what happened is they decided that they had to have everybody go off of one centralized data system so that every service provider, every person that provides, everybody that provides a service, everybody who comes in contact with a service provider, any, anybody who is in the homeless system at all at any time is in one central database. So they know exactly who has seen whom, where they've gone, what the, what the result has been, where they've been, who responded and, and all the rest. And I know enough about that in other cities, it's hard, hard to believe, but that's not the case. I listened to a webinar three, four months ago from the Downtown Seattle Association, and I was astonished that the head of King County's homeless operation, which is Seattle's county, the head of the city's Seattle's homeless operation were going, wow, this is really great. For the first time, we actually know what the county's doing. Oh, first time, we actually know what the city's doing. And I'm thinking, this is the city where the words Skid Row were invented. I mean, homelessness is nothing new to Seattle. And it's an enormous, it's worse up there than it is here. And these guys, how does it, the city and county don't talk to each other? So, you know, lots of these things are in the ways, I mean, I can go more into what Houston was doing, but lots of these things are, again, it, it boils down to leadership, willpower, and, you know, the, the ability to, to try things to make them work. I met a guy in Houston, he runs a multi-billion dollar REIT. He's a real estate guy, but the mayor asked him to be tasked with looking into the homeless issue. And he said the first thing they did is they said nobody gets a nickel until they're signed on to the centralized data system so that they can have people held accountable, which, you know, held accountable are two words that in San Francisco are not in our vocabulary and um, not just for homelessness. But so that's that's something that was really important because people want to know they'll spend the money but they wanna know what they're getting for it. And we can talk about that a little bit afterward. I've got one last section I'm gonna motor through quickly, which is I wanted to end on an up note rather than a down note. Mm -hmm. um, one thing or one area where cities have done not just a good job, they have done an incredible job in the last 20 years or so has been in the areas of parks and open space and trails. And this is all over the country and there are just, and it continues, there are more and more underway and they've been transformative for cities and when people look to how our city is going to compete in the future this is one of the ways which is to create these incredible places for the public because what are cities but the end gathering of lots of people and people like to be where there's other people assuming you feel safe and it's clean and what have you so a number of, we're going to film a number of these stories i've met the people behind most of these parks um, this is a park in houston uh, this is downtown Houston right over here. This runs west toward the city's, so down over here is the city's biggest park, is Memorial Park, which just underwent a $200 million redo. But this was a $160 million redo of a, the Buffalo Bayou, which in the 70s was going to become a concrete drainage ditch. And it was by the Army Corps of Engineers and three unlikely people stopped it from happening. Um, it's always people. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman George Bush Sr., guy who was president, mm -hmm. a guy named George Mitchell, who was a billionaire oil guy who developed the Woodlands, which is a whole community just north of Houston, and a woman, Terry Hershey, who was a socialite, but a big environmentalist. And they were the ones who banded together to stop this from becoming a concrete ditch. Um, and then it took a guy who, working for a San Francisco landscape firm, SWA, but he lived in Houston, because they have a big Houston office, he was agitating for the city of Houston started down around here. At, there's a bend in the bayou down over here. And he was agitating for them to make some sort of a park, not professionally, but just as a resident of Houston to do that. And that eventually caught fire. And it eventually became Buffalo Bayou Park, which runs these 2.3 miles. It's an incredible park. They raised $160 million for this. It has been so successful. They are now going in this direction. Um, this goes into the wealthiest part of Houston. This goes into an industrial and a poor part of Houston. They are doubling the size of the park in this direction. They just got $100 million from a foundation that's funding a lot of stuff through there. And they are trans they're going to transform this. I, I went on a tour with them when I was down there in, in January. And they, as a park conservancy, have bought parcels of property to guard against the increase in value that's going to happen naturally because of the park so that they can build affordable housing. 
but you know, this is the Park Conservancy getting involved in the affordable housing thing. And, you know, it's, it's again, something that, it, this is Texas, right? They run around and pick up trucks and shotguns and they're, they're doing some really forward thinking things here. And uh, I'll show you some pictures. That's the Bayou Park. Um, you know, it runs 2.3 miles. It's also, I mean, I, I picked these parks also because I've been there and they're beautifully designed. So it's not just that they're green. They have art, they have trails, they have all kinds of things. I mean, this is, you know, this never looked so green and so nice when it was there. Um, this is one of the two adjacent dog parks at Buffalo Bayou Park. You've never seen dog parks like what they've done. This is for the big dogs and then there's one for the small dogs. Mm -hmm. And the dogs get water jets and they get their own pools and... <laughs> This thing has also been destroyed three times due to flooding, but that's a Houston thing. And they have, you know, they have drainage issues, which is another story that we're gonna film. But um, it's incredible what they've done in this park. Um, another park that it opened a couple of years ago, this was the largesse of over $200 million from the George Kaiser Foundation in Tulsa. And it was a $460 million park called The Gathering Place, which is near downtown Tulsa. That's part of the playground that's there. Um, that's uh, sort of man-made beaches and lagoons. This is right near what they, right near the river in Tulsa, but it's um, and it's a pretty incredible park when you go there. Um, and that's the picture that I took when I was there. That I took this actually when I was there in when was I there in January. Um, they have a lodge that looks like a national park lodge, mm -hmm. and you can you, there's a fireplace on the far left. You can't really see it, and even though it was 42 degrees or whatever that day. Um, it's like an incredible space with what they have. They have kayaking, they have, they have their own tunnel tops. They have a roadway that they then put, you know, it's not as extensive as here, but it was the same kind of thing. It's called the Gathering Place. Um, that's Oklahoma. Um, this is Oklahoma City. And that's the Devon Tower. Three blocks to the left is the school I was showing you. Mm -hmm. um, Oklahoma City is a city that is Republican that way, that way, that way, and that way. And the state is even redder. <laughs> and Oklahoma City has voted four times in the last 25 years to tax themselves for capital improvements. And it is enormous things that they build. It doesn't matter if it's a new library, if it's a new sailing center, if it's a new convention center, it's a new sports arena, it's a minor league ballpark, it's a canal system trying to copy San Antonio's Riverwalk. Mm. And they moved Interstate 40, which is a national trunk line interstate a mile south so they could create a 70 acre Central Park downtown, mm. which is, I mean, it, it, it's, honestly, it's not my favorite park design, but it's like, who has the balls to build a 70 acre park in the middle of down, or on the edge of downtown, the new convention, whoops. Um, let, me, let me go back. Well, they moved, they didn't, they moved the freeway to do it. And then actually you still go beyond it to get to the other 30 acres of the park because it's so, it's so expansive, but it's zoned for high density development around it with the idea that the park creates value for the space and one day that's their goal is to have you know 10 and 12 story condo towers ring it they have the convention hotel they have the new convention center there um this is another shot of the park um there's another park there's two there's four square blocks beyond this that need to be developed and then there's another nice park that is older that's behind that but why did these people vote to do all this stuff because and i've met the current mayor and the former mayors and stuff they always vote to tax themselves as Republicans because the city always delivers on time and on budget. Mm -hmm. So that when they did the last one, which was in November 2019, when just before I had met the current mayor, just before it was on the ballot, he said, we've been doing, this is Oklahoma City, we've been, and he's a Republican, we've been doing all these things for downtown all these years and for schools. We need to do stuff for the neighborhoods. So they had a charrette around the city and they had 16 items that they were gonna fund, that they did fund. And these items were, again, Republicans, seniors, public health, homeless, recreation, <laughs> um, all, all kinds of things that you wouldn't associate with an all Republican city. And like he said, but MAPS, it's Metropolitan Area Projects, has such a good name that we will win. And they had over 70% of the vote and they, they got the vote for that even in Oklahoma City. But that's what's called holding people accountable and if they hold them accountable, people are willing to spend the money. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting lesson learned there. This is another park that's been transformative. This is Railroad Park in Birmingham, Alabama. This was designed by Tom Leader, who's actually over here in Berkeley. Um, I knew about the park first before I knew Tom and knew that he did it. But um, this is a 19-acre park, downtown Birmingham, you can obviously see. 
And uh, to the right, there's a beautiful new minor league ballpark that's right here. University of Alabama Medical Center is right here. And the University of Alabama Birmingham campus now is right here. It's a few blocks further south. But the trick with this park was this was basically empty yards. It was going to become used car lots. Uh, Birmingham has really cool hills, but they have no water features. So they call this their river, the four main railroad tracks that run through the city, which gives this the name Railroad Park. Did not have a huge budget. The big issue with Railroad Park was in a city that's 70% black, and you know, given where it's located and the way it's looking and everything else, who's going to be automatically drawn there? How do we get the rest of the community involved? So they had extensive outreach and programming and all the rest so that you know, the perfect antidote to this is when I drove into Oklahoma City last in January, um, I came in really late at night after driving around downtown to my hotel and the black woman at the, at the front desk, we were talking and I mentioned that I was looking at Railroad Park and the first thing out of her mouth was, oh, I just love Railroad Park because it's like a symbol of pride for the city and, and everybody has ownership in it. And I'll show you a couple of shots of it. Um, you know, it's just, they do all kinds of things um, there and it's got a view of the city, but it's, you know, the, this was something that never existed before in, in Birmingham. Um, this is a shot of the Atlanta Beltline, which you guys know about the High Line in New York. We filmed a story on that. We're going to compare it to the Beltline in Atlanta, which is four railroads on a 22 mile loop around the core of the city. It was the idea of a guy who I recently met with who did this for his Georgia Tech master's thesis. And it became, and there's a whole bunch of backstory, but Needless to say, what the Beltline has become, and it's a walking and jogging trail that was originally envisioned as a streetcar loop, and there's a huge political fight right now in Atlanta because this thing is so popular, and the, the guy who originally came up with this wanted the streetcars to run on it, and there's a fight whether they should or not. But it has kicked off, and I kid you not, and it's an issue in Atlanta, both good and bad, billions with a B in development in Atlanta. It is unbelievable how much stuff has been built along the Beltline. And it's, been, it's the identity of the city right now. And it's all because of what they did with you know, the trails and open space. It was four railroads that had this thing together. And then two more things I'm gonna show you. Um, everybody, know, most people know San Antonio has a river walk, but most people don't know San Antonio has a second river walk that just opened. And it's called San Pedro Creek. And it's uh, a creek that runs parallel to the San Antonio River, but this was mostly covered up and they decided, hey, we should get another amenity downtown, but instead of making it commercial, it's what's called an art and culture park. So it's got all kinds of murals and waterfalls and, and things with plantings and flowers and what have you. And the idea was, um, this is a bank headquarters building, is San Antonio, the, again, talking about office markets, the business of San Antonio is not downtown. The tourists are there, but the business part of San Antonio is not downtown. So they wanted to draw more business development downtown, and they thought that this would be an amenity to help p get people to locate there. So um, San Pedro Creek is a, is a really, I, I find it to be a really spectacular place. And, um, you know, this is what it looks like at night, the kind of stuff that, you know, there's a lot of art that, and murals that go along with this, and like I say, waterfalls. And then this is in New York on the Brooklyn side uh, near Williamsburg. There's the old Domino Sugar Factory, which is being renovated right now. There's a bunch of high-rise condos that are part of it. The Sugar Factory building's actually becoming offices. But um, James Corner, who did the High Line, um, you've got a kind of mini High Line along here. This is what's left over from the Sugar Factory. And you'll see the view in a second. Um, when I was there last year, I took, I took some pictures. And uh, I mean, that's the view of Manhattan when you're there, like right on the water. I mean, it's a spectacular park when you're walking along there. There are a couple of other parks in New York. Brooklyn Bridge Park is incredible on the waterfront. And there's a new one at Hunter's Point that just opened as well. That's incredible. Um, and then lastly, we do it in San Francisco too. And I don't know how many people here know about Crane Cove Park, but this is down on around 20th in Illinois. And you know, it's kind of a mini, like being at aquatic park. It's a beach right on the water. They left the, the cranes left over from the Bethlehem Yards. Um, it's, a re, you know, it's a really nice park and there's still a couple buildings to be turned, I think, one into an art space, one into a food space that the ports got out for RFP. So, I mean, it's not like we don't know how to do this either. We do, and we do it. And so um, I wanted to leave on an up note that um, parks are a really great thing about cities. So that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we 
ended on an up note, but we also want to end it with a couple of questions. Does anybody have, you know, I mean, obviously there's lots of other issues in the city, and Ron seems to have studied them all in about 50 different cities. Does anybody want to ask about their favorite or least favorite problem? And, and, and uh, we'll get an answer. Doesn't have to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want you to have a problem. <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, this is just fabulous in some way. I, I, I'm curious about one of your opening comments. You said, you know, do you vote? And I hope you vote. And I wonder if you can elaborate on it a little more. Um, and and if you could talk a little bit about how we have such problems managing and governing ourselves. I mean, uh, I don't quite understand, you know, the function or dysfunction of the supervisor system and how that plays or doesn't play into it. So if you can talk a little bit about the political process and what the citizens can do there to help. Okay, let me caveat first by saying that, I mean, supervisors are our city council because we're a city county. Lots of cities have screwed up city councils. So that doesn't excuse us, but just the LA city council is a mess, the Chicago city council is a mess, the New York city council is a headache. You know, you can go <laughs> the places and the councils can be that. Um, we, I, I'd argue that our, our city government doesn't represent the city. We have a bunch of people in there that have their agendas, but their agenda doesn't match up to the city. But it's, you know, this is a city where people, you know, it's, the weather's great. Generally our economy, you know, people are generally pretty wealthy, pretty educated and all the rest. So people are like, what do they need to get bothered for? Um, who cares about the public school system? Because most people don't, you know, most people don't have kids in the city. And if you do have kids, we have 33% or 32% of the kids in the city go to private schools. So they're not invested in, in the public school system, although they always vote to give them money for some weird reason. Um, is, is that is paying attention to who people vote for, like for supervisor. It's really important. I mean, I will throw out names and it's too bad. You know, I mean, it's really important that people like Joel and Guardio, who just got elected, at the very, you know, in the last second, it's really important that people like Joel get on the board of supervisors because, you know, he gives a damn about just getting things done. He's not interested in what color flag he's going to wave today. He's interested in, you know, do the cops show up? Is the garbage picked up? Are the streets clean? Do the merchants feel secure? Um, you know, those kinds of things where people are, but we tend to attract people who, you know, we've gone kind of the, we, we, we basically have gone sort of the, the there's, there's the Trump wing and there's the San Francisco wing and they kind of meet together. You know, they're so far, they're so far out there that the proto-fascists meet the proto-fascists from the right <laughs> because, you know, you can't, you can't disagree with them and everybody's, you know, you can't say anything, you can't do anything, you can't whatever. And it's like, stop being afraid. This chair is a white chair. I can't do anything about it, and I'm not afraid to say it. But, you know, but there are so many people who are afraid in the political arena to, and I'm talking about non-touchy stuff. They're just afraid to, you know, say what is, to say, you know, yes, it's not a good thing that people's stores are getting broken into all the time in this city. I don't mean the shoplifting, I'm talking about, look, I grew up in the city, I don't ever remember seeing so many boarded up places because people had broken in overnight. I mean, I know a guy who's he's a filmmaker. He's, there's a building at 135 9th Street, which is a nonprofit film building. I had lunch with him about four or five months ago. They were broken in four times in one month. You know, and it's like, what do you, you know, how do you, how do you, you got to deal with this stuff. And, and we're a city that doesn't pay attention to the blocking and tackling of getting things done. I, mean, I look around the city, the city, I just came back from Boston. I was speaking in New York at the Harvard Club and I went up to Boston. Boston was spotless. I mean, there's nobody working in the financial district, although their subway lines are really busy because they have a lot of students and they have some tourists, so there's people on the trains, but there's nobody, I mean, it's like here, it's quiet in terms of the financial district, but the streets are spotless. I don't know, I mean, it's not that hard on Sunday night. I know it's Sunday, but you drive around the city on Sunday night and you take a look at, forget about the garbage on the streets, you take a look at how many garbage cans that are on the streets that are overflowing. You know, if I was still back in City Hall, I'd be yelling and screaming, okay, let's get DPW. Just make the effort. Just then de deploy 20 people on a Sunday to clean it up because then the citizens will, you know, it's half of this is psychological about the quality of life in, in a city. It's like, show that you're making progress. Show that you care. You know, show, and I'm not saying people don't care, but there are some minor steps that are, if you will, non-political, non-contentious, like emptying garbage cans. <laughs> That, that we could do a much better job of that would make both residents feel better and also visitors feel better. I'm embarrassed. 
walk. I mean, forget about the drug. I mean, you see the drug dealers and the guys. I had lunch with the ex head of Spur three weeks ago, and I walked right near the palace, right next to the palace hotel, leaning against their wall, where three, two guys and a girl shooting up, mm-hmm. you know, just in the middle of the day. And I'm not saying go we'll put them in jail, but it's like they don't belong there. You know, they, the city belongs to all of us. It doesn't just belong to those people who have sort of grabbed the streets. And we've sort of allowed, you know, a group of people in the political world. We, we don't attract necessarily the best and brightest to get into politics here. We don't do that in general as a country, but we don't do it in this city in particular because we have so many distractions. I mean, we're blessed with that, but that also hurts us in a sense. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's... Uh... Anyone over here? Oh. Sorry. We only have time for one more, so. I'll be around after. I mean, if you guys want to talk. Yeah. How would you, how would you. Uh, Tom. It's not, how would you fix the process of, of the permitting and so on? I mean, what, what would you start tearing down? And, you know, if, if you could, could. Well, they're working They're I mean. People are finally working on it. But with, what? But in in what ways? Just to say. Well, oh, so discretion. For example, there's a thing called discretionary review, which is even after, even if you conform to everything you're supposed to do, even if you're approved by all the entities in government that are supposed to approve you, so you've run the gauntlet. This nice young woman here can stand up and say, "I'm going to stop you, or I'm going to sue you, or I'm going to appeal this, or I'm going to do whatever." And they can do that whether you want to add a deck to your house or whether you want to build a 42-story building. And so that's a, they're working on getting that. We, we have that in, in San Francisco, which other cities don't, that makes it so easy for just you know, one person or two people to throw, to constantly throw, you know, gum up the works and all the rest. And how can we fix that? Well, by changing, we can change the rules. I mean, one of the things I'll throw out that's related to that is San Francisco now has more public employees per capita than any city in the country, including New York and Washington, which is, which is insane. But one of my frustrations is, I've worked in City Hall, so I don't wanna tell you people don't work, they do work, and they really work. But the problem is, we have created so many constraints, all in the name of doing something to serve something, that it takes five people to do what in any other city one person does. So we have all these employees that we pay for, and we wonder why nothing ever works. And the frustrating part for me is, Nobody asks any questions. Nobody is out there saying, well, how many people, I mean, I don't know. The planning department's always overworked and understaffed, but the planning department's fairly large. And I'm not picking on them, I'm saying, so they're overworked and fairly large. I have no idea, is Seattle's planning department smaller? Is it bigger? Is their budget bigger? Is their permit time longer? There's no benchmarking to find out how do we compare to other places. We don't, you know, we kind of just live in this vacuum here and nobody does anything. I mean, I don't think too many people in town here, I mean, how many of you people know Denver? Mm-hmm. You know, we have a Transbay terminal that, you know, how do you spend two and a half billion dollars on a train station without a train? I, I, I mean, I've got no idea how you do that, okay? <laughs> but we did it, it's taxpayer money, we did it. But we, how many We pe- learned from Japan, we, we, they built a bridge to an island, you know, <laughs> yeah. for 300 million and there was only 20 people on the island. Yeah, but, it, but in Denver, they've got a thing called Union Station which, you know, they redid an old train station, but they redid the yards behind it, but all the light rail lines, the commuter train, the airport train, an underground bus station, everything feeds into Union Station. It was delivered on time and on budget. I'm not saying we have to copy them, but when we were going through the thing about the Trans Bay, where was there a story anywhere that said, hey, Denver had a kind of smaller version, but multimodal transit hub, there's no reporting about that. LA's Union Station is doing, un- they're, they're doing unbelievable things in LA at Union Station, but there's no reporting on that here. You know? And then we turn around and we look at government, and I was in City Hall, you look at government, and part of the reason some of these people come to the decisions they do is they hear who yells and screams, but they also never get any good information. Or they don't, they don't not never, but they don't always get good information because there's no information in this town. You know, I mean, that's, you know, I thought that, we were the information capital of the universe uh, <laughs> with, with our computers and everything. Okay, so, so anyway, that's just great. And, and uh, Ron, your, your ability to, to uh, bring the idea of comparison and actually getting data of how other people do things is a wonderful one. I hope it gets adopted by a lot of people. I'm sorry we have to bring this to an end, but if you have other questions, Ron said he'd be quite willing to stay and answer them. So thank you very much for coming. 
And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 121st year of enlightened discussion. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thank you.